you would, grab your Bible, turn to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel 12. We conclude a sermon series we began way back in 2020. Not that we've been preaching the same series for three years now, but uh, we took a hiatus from it, circled back to it uh, several weeks ago, and we concluded today with a chapter that anticipates resurrection. Daniel chapter 12. Let us read this chapter and have the text before us. Hear now the word of the true and living God. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream, and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream, How long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven, and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time times and half a time and that when the scattering and that and that when the scattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end all these things would be finished i heard but i did not understand then i said o oh my lord what shall be the outcome of these things he said go your way daniel for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined. But the wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. But go your way till the end, and you shall rest, and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. Let us pray. As always, Father, we are feeble, we are frail. Like Daniel, we hear, but we need understanding. We need Holy Spirit wisdom to grasp the things communicated here. And so, Father, we pray, help us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. It's the wise man that I will remind you once said, better is the end of a thing than its beginning. And so we come to the end of Daniel, which certainly holds out good news even for us who live some uh, 2,500 years, over 2,500 years, after Daniel lived. The end of Daniel is concerned with the end. Specifically, contextually, chapter 11, verse 45, 
talks about his end. Verse 45, And he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. And this angelic being who is speaking to Daniel continues right into chapter 12. It is part of the same context. And so the end has to do with the end of Antiochus Epiphanes IV. And if you weren't here last week, we had a little bit of a history lesson, because that's what Daniel chapter 11 is about. History that is yet to take place for Daniel, but which would be a, well, as is described here, a time of distress uh, so great, a time of trouble so great, it will have been like no other time with no other nation up to that point. But then, in the very last verse of Daniel chapter 12, after there's a couple of questions that are asked here, one specifically from Daniel, you have this statement here in verse 13, go your way till the end, and you shall rest, Daniel, you shall rest, and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. The end of the days is a very interesting phrase. It only appears here in all of the Old Testament. And I believe it anticipates the, well, the end of the days, the, the end of time. That one day that we were just singing about. One day he's coming, O oh, glorious day. And Daniel will find his allotted place on that day. Just like I'm persuaded each one of us shall find our allotted place in that day. Whether we rest like Daniel or whether Jesus comes back. Whichever comes first. This chapter, Daniel chapter 12, communicates that God rewards His faithful people. And it shows, I believe here in Daniel 12, how God does that which we, we will work through here. Uh, let's go back to verse 1. Daniel 12, as was mentioned, is related to the immediate context of Daniel chapter 11. And in fact, Daniel 12 is uh, concluding this prophetic message that we spent some time last week unpacking and all the history that was yet to come from even Daniel's day through the Persian Empire, the, the, the Greek Empire, and into the days when that Greek Empire was divided, and the coming time in the mid-2nd century B.C. when this really, really bad guy, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, would show up and just run roughshod over the Jewish people from about the year 169 to 163. And uh, we'll, we'll unpack that more because it, it is related here. You get a time stamp for how long these things are going to last, and, and we'll, we'll break that down in more detail shortly. But verse 1. You have a promise here of deliverance during a time of trouble. Uh, at that time shall arise Michael. Michael is here called the great prince who has charge of your people. Elsewhere in Scripture, he is Michael the archangel. And so we've talked about this before. There are different orders of angels, just like there seems to be somewhat of a hierarchy within the, the domain of darkness, uh, that both... Uh, the good angels and the bad angels have their respective hierarchy in the spiritual realm. We don't have a lot of information about it, but there do seem to be angels, generally speaking, but then there are archangels, and Michael is an archangel. And he has charge over your people, Daniel's people, Daniel's people, that is, the people of Israel. Uh, and again, we unpacked a bit of that when we looked at Daniel chapter 10 with reference to Deuteronomy 33 and how God has divided up the nations according to the sons of God and uh, that there are uh, angelic powers over every nation under heaven. Very interesting. And again, I'll refer you to Daniel 10 if you need a refresher on that uh, and the teaching we did there, uh, which is available on YouTube, of course. But here is Michael. Uh, and he is Israel's angelic protector, and so here comes this time of trouble. And again, I, I believe we're concluding from Daniel 11, and that time of trouble is coming for the Jewish people in the middle of the 2nd century B.C. 
a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. It's just, it's going to be awful. And we, we documented some of the awful things. You can see first, the, book of, the books of first and second Maccabees, which are historical uh, works, not a part of scripture, of course, but certainly val- valuable for history and gaining an appreciation for just what the Jewish people went through under Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Uh, and so, uh, again, here comes Antiochus Epiphanes. He's going to bring this really severe uh, persecution against the Jewish people, but there's this promise of deliverance. At that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. This is similar to, well, a book that Daniel was familiar with. Uh, You'll remember that Daniel, uh, way back in chapter 9 and verse 2, he had been reading from the book of Jeremiah. And in the book of Jeremiah, uh, chapter uh, 29, you had the time stamp there that the the exile is only going to last 70 years. And in Daniel 9, Daniel recognizes, hey, we're at the end of that time. And he begins to pray to God, and God gives him revelation about what is to come future, even the end of Daniel chapter 9, anticipating the coming Messiah. Uh, And after uh, 77s, or your translation may say 70 weeks, uh, which have to do with 490 years, as we talked about uh, then, that's when Messiah is going to come. And in the middle of the week, though, that final 70th week, he's going to bring deliverance from sin and and cleanse the people. and, And of course, that anticipates Christ coming and dying on the cross for our sins. But not only dying, of course, uh, here we are on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, Jesus rose from the dead. He dies for our sins and he rises for our justification. All these things prophesied by Daniel uh, hundreds of years, centuries before any of these things take place. Once again, demonstrating Daniel is a true prophet of God and his book uh, just like all other prophecy given by God, is truly the Word of God. But after Jeremiah chapter 29 comes Jeremiah chapter 30. Go figure, right? Verse 7 of Jeremiah chapter 30 talks about, Alas, that day is so great there is none like it. It is a time of distress for Jacob. And the word, first of all, Jacob, that's... uh, what was Jacob's other name, but Israel. And so this is prophecy concerning the people of God, uh, the Jewish people. And uh, there's this time of distress. That is the same word used here in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, that time of trouble, time of distress, time of trouble. Yet, coming back to Jeremiah 30 verse 7, yet he shall be saved out of it. So a time of distress with a promise of deliverance. The context for Jeremiah 30 has to do with the coming Babylonian captivity uh, and also the return from that captivity. We see this in verses 10 and 11 of Jeremiah 30. Then fear not, O Jacob, my servant, declares the Lord, nor be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from far away and your offspring from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return and have quiet and ease, and none shall make him afraid, for I am with you to save you, declares Yahweh. I will make a full end of all the nations among whom I scattered you, but of you I will not make a full end. I will discipline you in just measure, and I will by no means leave you unpunished. And so I I bring Jeremiah 30 and verse 7 up because of Daniel 12 here, has a similar, uh, a similar feel to it, similar language is used here, and it anticipates, again, the coming persecution of Antiochus Epiphanes IV, a very terrible time of trouble, but just like the captivity was a terrible time of trouble, there's promise of salvation, promise of delivery, and here is a similar thing, terrible tribulation, terrible uh, persecution coming for the Jewish people, but God is going to save them. And he'll do it specifically by taking away this really, really bad leader, ruler, uh, again, Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Whatever violent oppression this uh, madman is going to bring against God's people, God says, I'm going to deliver you from that. 
Uh, and, and especially, there's focus on the faithful of God because it is those whose names are found written in the book. And this seems to be the book of life. And so here is a promise for the faithful remnant who remains faithful even while persecuted to extreme severity. But those who are faithful even unto death, God promises reward. And that's what verses 2 and 3 are about. That even though you may face death in this life, there is victory for you on the other side. Verse 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Uh, sleep, those who sleep. Elsewhere in Scripture, and Old Testament and New Testament, by the way, all throughout the Bible, sleep is typically a figure for death. Coupled here with the phrase, in the dust of the earth, Remember the original curse way back in Genesis chapter 3, uh, that you are of dust and to dust you shall return. That uh, both of these statements here point to, again, the fact that uh, people are, uh, they've died. I also want to emphasize and note carefully here the word many in verse 2, and many of those who sleep. This, this isn't it doesn't seem to be the final resurrection of the dead. Because then I think it would say that everybody who's asleep and in the dust of the earth will rise. But the many here, again, in keeping with the context, are the many who suffered under, under the persecution of Antiochus Epiphanes IV, and those who awake, awake to everlasting life, those who were faithful to God, are rewarded with everlasting life. But those who turned away and perhaps denied their faith. Uh, they, all they faith, uh, face is shame and everlasting contempt. I'm persuaded that this is similar to what we read in the book of Revelation, chapter 20. And the book of Revelation certainly deserves its uh, own special study. Uh, perhaps sometime uh, in the future we'll get around to it. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, I just want to draw our attention here to Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. Because you have a very interesting state of affairs that arise here. Revelation 20, verse 4. Then I saw thrones, and seated on thrones uh, were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection, over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So you have this business of first resurrection, which implies a second resurrection, and that second resurrection appears to be the final resurrection of all, the, the rest of the dead, everybody. But there's this first resurrection, and you'll notice that it's specifically for, in verse 4, those who've been beheaded for their testimony uh, of Jesus and of the Word of God. Those who not worship the beast, they didn't receive the mark on the hand, on the forehead. They were faithful to God, even to the point of giving their life. And I believe Revelation 20 is answering a similar question that is being answered in Daniel chapter 12. What do I get if I have been faithful even unto death? And here... For the martyrs, just like in Daniel 12, Revelation 20, those who die under extreme circumstances of severe persecution, they receive the special reward, which is here called reigning with Christ for a thousand years. I know there's a lot of speculation about thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. It's very fascinating here that it doesn't say that Jesus begins his reign for a thousand years. 
He's already reigning. (laughs) But rather, the text is clear, they will reign with him for a thousand years. They join with him because he's already reigning. I bring Revelation 20 to the table because this seems to be the New Testament update and I believe gives a bit more light to help us clarify what's going on in Daniel 12. The many who even gave their life, died because of the persecution, what do they get? They awake for what seems to be a first resurrection, if you will, of everlasting life. Verse 3, those who are wise, and the wisest thing you can do is give your life in faithful obedience to God, even to the point of death. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. Those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And this is typical language in Daniel's day in the ancient Near East to describe kings and and rulers, this this star language and shining and, and these sorts of things. And what Daniel is doing is he's taking that language, which would have been familiar to his original audience, and applying it to them. Don't you realize? You become a king. You get to reign in the next life. This is part of that everlasting life that you receive. Even though, man, the madman Antiochus Epiphanes IV, it cost you your life, what he did to you. God is going to reward you in a very special way. God has his book. He knows who's in there. He knows their names. And he knows especially those who give their life in a martyr's death. He knows where people go. No one's going to gain God. No one's going to pull a fast one on him. I think we even sing a song sometimes, is your name written there? May I just ask, my brother, my sister, is your name written in his book? Only you can answer that in your own heart of hearts today. Verse 4, but you, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book, until the time of the end. And again, here, specifically in the context is the time of the end of Antiochus Epiphanes IV. And, and as we talked about last week, he, he's only going to be allowed so much time, and then he's removed out of the picture. It is interesting. Shut up the words, seal the book, uh, that because this thing is so far yet in the future, Daniel... Um, this is, this is supposed to be uh, sealed. It doesn't mean that the people aren't going to have the book, that Daniel is supposed to take the book and go buried in the ground until a later time when it will be dug up later, right? But rather, the, the sealing here, here, they'll have the book, and kind of like Daniel, they'll be able to hear what's in it. But the meaning of it is going to be hidden. The meaning is what is sealed. I say this because there's a a similar thing that happens in the book of Isaiah, chapter 29. Isaiah 29, verses 11 and 12. Here's a a prophecy, Isaiah, in a vision, seeing this prophecy concerning the coming destruction of Jerusalem that would take place by the Babylonians about 100 years in the future from Isaiah. And one of the things that is said here, verses 11 and 12 of Isaiah 29, uh, the vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. You see the same language here, sealing a book, right? When men give it to one who can read, and they say, read this, he says, "I, I cannot, for it's sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I can't read. And the, the sealing here of the book, again, they have the book, but they, they, it doesn't, there's no mean, they, we, we, they, the, the meaning escapes them. They don't understand what it is they are reading. And I believe that's what's going on here with this sealing of the book and, and all that. The, Daniel's prophecy was until the time of the end, and only then would it begin to come to light and make sense in that specific context. Well, naturally, verses 5 through the end of the chapter... Uh, Well, this lends itself to some confusion on Daniel's part. And there are a couple of questions that are asked here. Uh, Daniel, he's he's looking and behold. Remember, this started way back in chapter 10. Chapter 10 was kind of the prologue. 
with this angelic visitor, and we got to, uh, to peer behind the curtain. What's going on in the spiritual realm with this uh, uh, prince of the king of Persia who is, uh, stood opposed to this angelic being and very interesting things going on there. Chapter 11 was the uh, extended, detailed explanation of the vision that Daniel saw, and now we're bringing things to a conclusion. And, at the, and, and in Daniel 12, Daniel was by the Tigris River. We saw that in 10 and verse 4. Uh, he was standing on the bank of the great river. That is the Tigris. Well, here, coming back to Daniel 12, verse 5, two more angelic beings show up. One on one bank of the Tigris River, another on the other bank of the Tigris River. And here's Daniel, and he sees these two angelic beings. The one that he's been talking to is above the Tigris River. And, and someone, verse 6, said to the man clothed in linen, that's the, the man who's above the Tigris River that Daniel has been receiving revelation from, how long? Right? How long shall it be till the end of these wonders? I mean, isn't that, that's what we want to know, right? But even these, someone says it, who says it, we don't know, but could it have been one of these angelic beings? We're like, yeah, how long? The answer they get from the man clothed in linen, he raises his right hand and his left hand, and he makes a solemn vow. He swears to, uh, toward, uh, to him who lives forever, that it would be time, times, and half a time. And this is a prophetic way of talking about three and a half years. Uh, earlier in Daniel, we, we had similar phrases, three periods of time, uh, three and a half periods of time, and things like that. Also, this time, times, and half a time seems to correspond to verse 11 here, the 1,290 days. Three and a half years is approximately... 1,290 days, or say it a different way, 1,290 days is approximately three and a half years. And so this time, times, and half a time seems to correspond to that. That's how long it's going to take, the rest of verse 7, for the shattering of the power of the holy people to come to an end, for these things to be finished, all these things to be finished. Okay? Daniel, of course, verse 8, I heard, I didn't understand. So he says, he has his own question, Oh, my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? And the answer is fascinating. Verse 9, go your way. <laughs> uh, essentially saying to Daniel, look, um, you don't need to worry about it. Again, these things are so far in the future, um, you, all you've got to do is mind your business. And, and there, it'll be repeated in verse 13, um, go your way, you shall rest. You've been faithful in your generation. You've done what God has called you to do. And so he will rest. And again, these things are, are uh, far in the future. Go your way, Daniel. For the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. That's the same phrase that we saw back in verse 4, the time of the end. And again, this is the end of Antiochus Epiphanes IV. And the end of the persecution he's going to bring upon the Jewish people. Uh, verse 10, many shall purify themselves, make themselves white, and be refined, but notice, the wicked shall act wickedly. <laughs> just, I mean, unbelievers acting like unbelievers, can you believe it, right? I mean, that's, heathen's going to heathe, right? Uh, that's essentially what uh, Daniel is told here. None of the wicked shall understand. Uh, and, and the wicked would certainly be unbelievers outside of Israel, but talking about the, the remnant not all of Israel is Israel. Even some in Israel, this is, they're going to be part of that. They're just, it's going to go over their head. They're not going to understand. But those who are wise. And again, uh, we've, we've seen um, uh, back in verse 11.33, the wise among the people shall make many understand. Or shall we say, to borrow the language of Daniel 12, they'll turn many to righteousness. Okay? Uh, they'll, they'll go on their own evangelistic uh, outreach, as it were, during their day. Uh, yeah, these, these wise ones, they will understand. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Uh, blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. And so I do have uh, 
a slide here to show and I, uh, charts, right? <laughs> but I do believe, uh, again, we, we saw 2,300 days back in Daniel 8, uh, many, many moons ago, and that had to do with the entire persecution of Antiochus, starting way back uh, here in 169 B.C., and it runs all the way to 163 B.C., okay? So you had that time stamp over there in Daniel 8. For more on this, by the way, again, I mentioned 1 Maccabees. Uh, there's a lot here in Maccabees. If you're interested in that, jot those references down. You can look them up later. What we're interested in is down here in Daniel uh, 12, 1290 days, and then the 1,335 days. When Antiochus shows up, we talked about this last week, he was going to uh, desecrate the temple in Jerusalem. He was going to set up an altar to the false god, uh, Zeus, and he was going to offer a pig on the altar of God. Uh, this is what the abomination that causes desolation was all about in Daniel 11. Awful, awful stuff also done to the people of Israel. This begins the, the, the daily sacrifice, right? That's what is mentioned here. Uh, the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away. That's, that's what Antiochus Epiphanes does. And he sets up the abomination here. And so from this uh, time in the middle here uh, begins the countdown clock for when the sacrifices will be renewed. It does take, and again, you've got all these uh, 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 references here, 1,290 days, approximately three and a half years, the temple is desecrated, and it stands that way. But once Antiochus is removed, the abomination likewise is removed. You have all the, uh, the, the Maccabees doing their thing here as well. The abomination is removed. That's the end of the 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. It takes them 45 days to rem from the removal of the abomination to the renewal of the sacrifices. And uh, all this to say, wow. Right? You have the fulfillment in a very specific way of this prophecy that was given to Daniel in the 6th century B.C. Stuff that there's no way Daniel could have even anticipated. A kingdom has to fall, another kingdom has to rise, it has to be divided. This really bad guy shows up centuries after David is alive, excuse me, after Daniel is alive, and all the things that he would do in causing desolation and abomination within the temple, the specific number of days. Again, the, this kind of specificity in prophecy only comes because God has revealed history before it happens. You see, that's, as I mentioned last week, that's, that's what prophecy is, is God revealing history before it happens. Only God could know this, and he's the only one who graciously could have revealed it to Daniel centuries before it ever happens. By the way, this is part of the reason why I believe that the Bible is the Word of God. It is a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the life of other eyewitnesses that report supernatural events in fulfillment of specific prophecy. And they claim to be divine rather than human. The last thing here, verse uh, 13. I'll take that out. There we go. What, what's Daniel supposed to do? Go your way. You go your way till the end. And you shall rest. And the rest here is, corresponds back to verse 2. The sleep. He's, he's going to die. He's an old man when he's receiving this. It's toward the end of the Babylonian captivity. You shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. Again, that phrase, the end of the days, does not show up anywhere else in the Bible. The closest you get is in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 34, but uh, it is different. It just says the end of days, not the end of the days, which I think is significant because... What is anticipated here with Daniel receiving and, and standing in his allotted place is what's to come, even for us. Daniel, he did go his way, and he has rested from his labors. 
But blessed are those who die in the Lord, for they rest from their labors. But also we see he has his allotted place. And, and he'll receive his allotted place in the resurrection, just like we will receive our allotted place in the resurrection as well. Now, the only way that whether we're talking first resurrection or second resurrection is any kind of a reward is because of the one whom Daniel has prophesied about more than once in his book. Way back in Daniel chapter 2, there was this kingdom that God was going to set up. And no other, it would, it would turn all other mountains to molehills. And in fact, it would crush them into dust. In Daniel chapter 7, there was this one like a son of man who presented himself to the ancient of days who receives dominion and an everlasting kingdom. And in Daniel chapter 9, we saw one who was going to show up in the middle of the 70th week who's going to do marvelous things for his people, yes, but of course we recognize it's for all flesh, all nations, Jews and Gentiles. In other words, the only way we can have our resurrection, first or second, is because of the one who was to come who would lay down his life for his people, but then also because of the authority he had take it up again in his resurrection. Daniel anticipates this in his day. We, on this side of Calvary, we can anticipate it all the more. We have the prophetic word made more certain because Jesus came. Christ came. Christ died. Christ is risen again. He's ascended back to the Father's right hand and he will come again. One day he's coming. Oh, glorious day. Uh, briefly, just uh, a few points from the book of Daniel that, that I want you to walk away with from our study. Uh, the primary thing that Daniel wrote what he wrote, the primary purpose of it is to communicate the superiority of God over false gods, over kings who get a little too big for their britches, uh, over all kingdoms. He raises up kings. He takes down kings. God's superiority, superiority over everything. That's why Daniel is written. And one question that answers, uh, that, that the book of Daniel answers is, if God is so powerful, and he's so big, and he's so great, and he's superior over everything, why is it that we, his people, are in captivity? And the answer is, he's a covenant-making God, and he's a covenant-keeping God. He kept the covenant. His people, the fault was found in them. They did not keep covenant. And part of the covenant was that if the people did not keep covenant, I'm going to take you into captivity. He had promised it. He had warned them. To an even greater degree, a point of application for us, if I may, our God, he's still a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God. When you became a Christian, you made a covenant. And there are uh, blessings and curses attached to that. Blessings, everlasting life even, in Christ Jesus, if you remain faithful. But if you are a covenant-breaker, and you turn away, and you trample underfoot the blood of the covenant... All that were, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Brothers and sisters, we need to take this soberly. Take the warning soberly from the book of Daniel. God is a covenant-keeping God. One more thing, um, and we see it here. We've seen it for the last few weeks. God, you know, he knows everything, all right? Uh, the big word for this is omniscience, right? He, he knows everything. Um, he knows how he will use nations in the future, which is just fascinating when you think about it. You have all these, uh, these creatures, these, uh, these agents who have their own will, their own heart's desires and all that, and yet overruling all that is God not just knowing what they're going to do, but even in some cases causing certain circumstances to come around so that his will is accomplished even as they do their own sinful things. This is a, a fascinating thing to think about.
But God knows how he's going to use nations, how he'll use kings. He knows history. We also see he knows, uh, shall we call it meta-history? The, the history that's beyond human history. Uh, he, he knows what takes place and what is going to take place in the spiritual realm. I mean, the prince of the king of Persia is going to be taken away to make room for the prince of the king of Greece, right? That's happening in the spiritual realm, and God knows all that. Um, he knows the future, knows it with incredible detail. Only God could know the things that we've seen in the book of Daniel. He knows of coming conflict. He knows for Israel they were going to be caught in the middle of the king of the north and the king of the south. And may I just say that whatever trials, troubles, tribulation may come our way, he knows that too. He knows it. And he also, ready? He also promises his protection in the midst of whatever we're going through. That even if we are not delivered in this life from the physical persecution, there is a reward coming at the end of time. Because here's the thing, ready? He knows who's written in his book. Your name, prophet Isaiah talks about, your name was written on the hand of the suffering servant. That when our Savior dies on the cross, your name is written on his hand. He knows our names, and he knows his book. <clears throat> Daniel 12, we see that there are two ways, two types of people. There are the wise who are purged, they're refined, purified by God, but then there are also the wicked who, well, they act wickedly, as we saw. To the wicked belongs shame <clears throat> and everlasting contempt. But to the wise who are faithful to their God, God promises everlasting life. Now both, both are under the ever-watchful eye of the God of heaven. And, as we see, he knows where each one belongs. Let's commit this to prayer. <clears throat> Father God, we were encouraged by Daniel, and we thank you for your word that does promise a greater reward. It promises uh, eternal life. That can be ours in Christ Jesus in the here and the now, but also a fuller and final realization of eternal life in the resurrection. And we also know that it is only because Christ was raised on our behalf that we have the promise of a resurrection unto life. Help us, Father, to be faithful to you, be faithful to Christ in all things. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.